So, well, uh, I'd like to start by thanking uh, Michael for um, this opportunity and for um, people who've tuned in to watch. Um, I was actually looking forward to, to visiting Newcastle and then that just ended up not happening. So it's good to, good to connect in this way. Um, this talk is about uh, categories and, and presentations. And um, the previous talk was about essentially uh, presentations for, uh, for groups. Um, so we're already sort of in, in the mood for this. Um, I thought I would start with a, a little analogy from knot theory, um, which should be somewhat familiar to, to a lot of us. Um, the basic question of knot theory is you take a, a knot like this one and you ask, uh, can, you, can you undo the knot? Um, and so if you look at this for a little while, you can see that this uh, string could be sort of passed over this one. Uh, and then you can imagine sort of undoing a, a kink or two. And then uh, personally, once I've gone one or two steps, I then uh, forget what's going on. But um, fortunately, um, this thing from Wikipedia is actually movable and you can watch it actually completely unravel. So, um, so yes, this, this is an example of a knot that can be undone. Um, and so this is the, this is the driving question in knot theory and, um, this theorem of, of Rademeister from a, a very long time ago gives some kind of an effective kind of solution to this. Um, and it says basically if you have, um, two knots, um, maybe one is the unknot, uh, or maybe not, um, two knots are equivalent or in, in other words, two, uh, diagrams representing knots give rise to equivalent knots if and only if they differ by what are now called Rydermeister moves, which are these three um, very basic things. So um, you can get from one knot to another just by undoing a, a tiny little twist or introducing a, a twist, uh, moving one string in front of another string um, like so, or moving a string past a crossing of two other strings. Um, and well, the idea is that this allows us to think of uh, knot theory somehow combinatorially because um, basically a knot, which is a topological thing, is is built up uh, from a bunch of crossings. So in this picture, we've got you know about ten crossings over or under crossings, and essentially, as long as we know which strings go uh, and connect to other crossings, we've got a um, a kind of finite combinatorial description of the knot. Um, and then equivalence of knots is governed by not just a big uh, sort of topological thing, but just these combinatorial things, swapping um, straight edges with a, with a, a twist or uh, just introducing some crossings or, or changing the locations of crossings like this. Um, so that means, um, well, I was going to say something else about this, which is essentially that if you have a, uh, a knot um, and you want to know if it's equivalent to the unknot, then you're essentially asking, is there a sequence of, of these moves? Um, it's equivalent to the unknot if, there, if and only if there is a sequence of moves uh, going from the knot to the unknot, but it's quite possible you have to do many, many, many sequences of such moves. Um, and there are results about how many you would have to do, uh, but none of these lead to particularly practical um, algorithms or anything, although they do exist algorithms. Um, but the point is, these sort of things are, are very useful for uh, defining um, invariants of knots. So uh, all of these people have uh, knot invariants named after them, which are all polynomials. Um, the idea is you want to assign something uh, to a knot. It's usually a polynomial or a, or a number or, or something like that. Um, the idea being that if you're trying to work out if these two knots are equivalent, you work out the polynomial of this one and of this one. And if they're different, then they're different knots. Um, you might be unlikely and they're the same and they're not the same knot, but um, it's at least something to, to help us distinguish between them. Um, and so what's the idea? Well, we want to work out what uh, the invariant is associated to some knot. So we draw a, a diagram representing it like this one over here. Um, and then we somehow define, uh, define the invariant in terms of this picture. Okay. Um, the problem that arises is that there's many um, angles at which you could look at a knot and um, you might end up drawing very different diagrams. Um, so you just have to make sure for this thing to be well defined that uh, it's well defined up to equivalence based on just these uh, three simple moves. Um, so that's the uh, that's the idea of that. 
Right, so if you've worked with presentations, um, you're probably very um, uh, clued into the, the reason I've brought up this metaphor. Um, well, let's just, um, let's just think about what a presentation is. Uh, we saw presentations of groups in the previous talk, um, and it's easy enough to extend um, presentations to many other classes of um, algebra, so groups, rings, uh, and today, especially categories. Um, well, we say that our structure A has this given presentation XR, if uh, informally speaking, um, X is a generating set. So we've got a set of generators. R is a set of equations that happen to hold over X. Um, these are called relations. Um, so for example, if um, this structure is something like a group or a monoid, um, we might have a relation that says the two particular generators, um, X and Y say, um, commute. Okay, um, and R is not just some random list of equations, it has to be a complete set of equations. So in, in, the, in the sense that absolutely any equation that does happen to hold um, among the generators can actually be deduced from those um, in R. Um, if you wanna go into the formalities of this, which I won't during the talk, um, you essentially have to think of um, X being some kind of abstract set or something like a set. Um, and basically we, we have these um, things that can be, be combined using the, operate, the same kind of operations as your algebra has. So um, just multiplication if you're in a, in a um, monoid, uh, multiplication and inversion if you're in a group or more complicated things for other structures. Um, and then R is a set of essentially pairs of terms from this, uh, from this free algebra. And then we have a um, surjective homomorphism from the free structure to the, to the algebra. That's uh, formally saying that X generates A. And this business of um, the kernel is to say that, you know, any, any two words or any two terms over X map to the same uh, element of A, if and only they differ, uh, if and only if they differ somehow by using the relations from R. But we're gonna stick to the, the informal definition um, for this talk. Um, so one of the main reasons that we'd like to have presentations is because we can use them to define invariants in the same way that writer master moves help us um, deal with knots. Um, and by an invariant, I mean a, a homomorphism from A to something else. Um, the idea is that you've got these generators. So we say where we want the generators to map. So we define 5x for every generator. Um, and then if we're given an arbitrary element of our structure, well, X is a generating set. So we somehow write that element as a um, combination of these generators. Here for simplicity, I've just um, gone with a product. And well, if we know where phi maps each of these generators, then phi of A would have to be this, okay? Um, then there's a problem that given a, an, an element of your algebra, there might be many different ways to represent it. And applying phi to each generator appearing in such representations could potentially give you different, um, different things that you're saying is supposed to be phi of A. Um, so to make sure this is well defined, we just have to make sure that this mapping um, respects the relations or preserves them. Um, two different gen uh, representations of A, uh, there's, there's a transformation from one into the other using the relations, and each time we just have to make sure that um, this definition of phi um, matches up. So that's, um, that's one reason why we want to have presentations. There are a lot of other reasons, including just it's a nice way to, um, to define sometimes um, complicated structures, but um, this talk is more about uh, giving examples. So um, I'm gonna go through some classical examples. Um, the first one is uh, that I'll talk about is this one due to um, E.H. Moore from um, a rather long time ago. This is uh, about the symmetric group. So SN is the group of all permutations of one up to N. And uh, his presentation uh, is in, in terms of the um, simple transpositions. So SI is the transposition that switches I and I plus one, which I'm drawing diagrammatically like this. This should be point one all the way up to point N and that's the I point swapping with I plus one. Um, we teach students that every permutation is a product of, of such um, simple transpositions. Um, so these guys are generators and I've listed a, um, a set of relations here. 
can see why each of them holds. So this one just says that if you do a transposition and then do it again, it just undoes itself. Um, this, this represents the empty word. So we're talking about um, essentially a group presentation or even a monoid presentation here. Um, okay, the second relation says that if the points that are being moved are suitably far enough apart, then the transpositions commute, as you can see from this picture. Uh, and then when they're adjacent, we have um, what's called a braid relation that um, says, for example, here S232 equals S323. Um, and you can see that both of those are just uh, expressions for a transposition of non-adjacent elements. Um, so the point is, We've, we've checked that each of these relations hold. The more complicated part of um, proving the theorem is showing that, that this is a complete set of relations. Um, and Moore's paper does so, and um, it's remarkably um, possible to read it, even though it's so old. Um, this is another nice presentation that's quite uh, related to that, and it's, um, it's of uh, the art and braid group. So the braid group consists of um, objects like this, so they're a little bit like permutations, except now instead of just having a line from a point to a point, we actually have um, strings joining the points up like so, and they can pass in front or behind of each other. And um, it turns out these, um, these braids are generated by what, what Arten called simple braids, and these are uh, similar to transpositions, except now we've got a string passing in front and behind. Um, and this is a group presentation, so we have inverses of these guys, which would be uh, instead of string i going over string i plus one, uh, the other way around, so string i plus one passes in front. Um, and these uh, simple braids generate the braid group because if you uh, draw your picture like this, then draw a horizontal line so that there's um, exactly one crossing in between, um, you've basically just already written it as a product of the generators. Um, and as for the relations, they basically look the same as, uh, as on the previous page, in fact, they're the same relations um, except for the one that says that the generators undo do themselves because now they don't. Um, and if you look at this uh, third relation here, which as I said before is called the braid relation, that's because it comes from the braid group. Um, and in fact, just looking at what happens uh, in the diagram of this uh, relation, essentially this red string goes over this crossing here. So this is in fact a, um, basically a rider must to move. Right, so those were, um, those were a couple of group presentations. Um, there's, uh, there's a lot of um, presentations known for all kinds of other structures, including semigroups. Um, and uh, so many of the semigroups I work with, um, I'll talk about on the next couple of pages. So um, in all of the uh, rest of the talk, I'm always going to write uh, bold n for the set of um, integers one up to n. If n is zero, this is um, considered to be empty. Um, so a couple of semigroups I want to talk about. The first is the full transformation semigroup, which is a set of uh, all functions from this set to itself under composition. Okay, no longer we, do we restrict to bijections, but absolutely any function. And then we've got a couple of related ones, so we can think about partial functions, which um, composes uh, as binary relations, and then within uh, Within this, we've got what's called the symmetric inverse semigroup, which is all the partial bijections or, or partial permutations. So these are three well-known semigroups that, um, that I'll come back to every now and then. Um, so each of these contains a symmetric group because any bijection is a partial bijection, it's a partial function, and it's a function. Um, and this is, in fact, the group of all invertible elements in these, um, in these semigroups. Well, they're all monoids. So um, here's a... Uh, well, first a reminder of what this um, symmetric group presentation was. I'm now going to show you a few um, semigroup presentations. So this is um, the full transformation semigroup. So all mappings from n points uh, to itself, all self maps of one up to n. We basically start with Moore's presentation for the symmetric group, take all of these generators and these relations. extra generator which is pictured down here it's just a function that um, is not a permutation the simplest such thing might map one and two both to one and then just everything else identically um, and it turns out that you only have to add a very, a very small number of additional relations um, and you end up with a presentation for that um, I won't go through why all of these relations hold but it's easy enough to see why they do um, so for example this uh, part of 
the fifth relation, E equals S1E. If you imagine before E, swapping one and two, then you map one and two to the same place where well, you, you can just remove the, the transposition one, two from that. Um, here's a presentation for the symmetric inverse semigroup. So this was all um, partial permutations. Again, we extend the presentation for the symmetric group by adding a single uh, non-bijection. Now we're talking about a partial bijection. So the simplest such thing might be missing one point from the, from the domain and range. All right, and there's um, presentations for um, the partial transformation semigroup as well, but I haven't, uh, haven't listed that. Um, so what about categories? Um, first of all, uh, I'm just going to um, briefly talk about what kinds of categories uh, we're going to talk about today. So categories um, can be quite wild, but um, this is all about particularly um, special class of category. Um, we're always going to have categories uh, with objects set the natural numbers. And um, right, what we, uh, what we uh, the, the way to, to think about the categories um, that we're talking about are like a partial monoid, All right? So um, we're thinking about uh, a category as a set of morphisms or a set of things that you can sometimes compose. Um, so what have we got? We've got a set, C is a set. So this is a small category. Uh, we've got a set of morphisms and you can sometimes compose a pair of, of, of things. Um, I'll say a bit more about this in a second. So sometimes we write X, Y for the composition or X um, circle Y for the composition. Um, we've got domain and range functions, which will tell us when we can compose things. These are both things that say, well, what's the domain of say X and it's gonna be a natural number because that's our object set. Um, and instead of just having an identity element, like every monoid does, we have um, generally many, uh, one for each object. All right, so what are the, what are the properties? Well, um, we can define a product X times Y precisely when the domains and, and ranges match up. So um, wherever X maps to its range, that has to be the same as where Y maps from. So uh, range of X has to equal the domain of Y. Um, I'm thinking of these things as mapping from, um, from left to right. Uh, and when we can compose um, or multiply two elements, um, we keep the domain of the first one. So domain of X, Y is the domain of X, and we keep the range of the second one. Okay, um, whenever you can form a product of any three uh, elements, um, we have this associative law. So this is kind of a um, partial associative law, I guess you could call it. Uh, and then as for the identities, well, they act as identities whenever they can be, uh, uh, whenever compositions exist. So if I, if I can combine this thing, iota or something with X, then it's just gonna be X, likewise um, left and right compositions. All right, so for us, that's what a category is, basically a partial monoid. Right, so if we want to um, think of such a, a thing as a, as a category in the traditional sense, um, the set of morphisms from M to N is just the set of um, elements of our category uh, with domain M and, and range N. Um, and in particular, if M equals N, so we look at these things, C N N, um, we can compose elements of, of this set with other elements of this set because the domains and ranges match up, they're always equal to N. So we get a semi-group and because of these identity elements, we in fact have a, a monoid. So these things are um, monoids, they're called endomorphism monoids and I'll generally denote them as CN. All right, so a, a good example to um, keep in your head, uh, although I'll be covering other ones, is a set of all um, finite matrices over um, some field, like the real numbers, for example. Um, the domain and range operations are just counting the number of rows and, and columns of matrices. And we know we can compose or multiply A and B when the number of, um, what is it, number of rows of A equals the number of columns of B or, or the other way around, um, probably, um, probably the other way around. So then we've also got identity matrices and, and everything works nicely. Right, so um, I wanna, talk about a couple of examples of categories related to the semi-groups that I mentioned before. So um, we're going to um, keep using this bold N notation and um, the full transformation category, as opposed to the full transformation semi-group, consists of all functions uh, from one of these sets to another of these sets, all right? So for every M and N, we have all of the functions like this. So a fixed morphism set would take um, elements M and N 
and just look at all functions between these two fixed sets. And um, what's an endomorphism monoid? Well, we just take m equals n in the previous, and we end up with um, just all the functions from n to n, which is exactly the, um, the full transformation semigroup. So this is like a, a categorical version of, um, of Tn, a big um, expanded transformations um, transformation semigroup. Then, of course, we've got um, examples based on the other semigroups, so the partial transformation category, um, which uh, is just all partial functions. Then we've got the symmetric inverse category, all um, partial bijections. So I'll, I'll come um, to these guys in, in passing every now and then, but um, I'm not particularly expecting you to remember all the, um, all the t uh, symbols and, and terminology for these. Um, now I just want to talk about um, really, I guess, the, the main motivating example for this, um, this work, which is um, the partition category, which is an example of a, of a diagram category. So I'll give you the, um, the definition of this. Um, we're going to now not only talk about um, bold M, but um, a second copy of, um, of bold M. So we've got a um, couple of um, disjoint sets of size M. Um, for arbitrary natural numbers, uh, we're going to write PMN for all the set partitions of um, M undashed points with N dashed points. Okay, um, there's an example, which um, don't, um, don't try and take it all in yet, but apparently if um, we look at one up to six and one dash up to five dash, every one of those points is in precisely one of the blocks of this, um, of this set here. So rather than um, thinking of these things abstractly, we think of them diagrammatically and um, here is a, a diagram representing this partition. We draw the dash, undashed points um, in a row like this at the top and the dashed points in a row at the bottom. And then taking these blocks, we, um, we just add edges to this picture um, and each block tells us a connected component of this picture. So kind of join these together. Um, two, four is this block. Um, and you just go through like that. You can even have singleton blocks if you like. Um, blocks can join top to bottom or blocks can only um, be contained in the top row or the bottom row. Um, so it's kind of like those pictures we drew of um, permutations and, and functions, but you just um, do anything you want, basically. Now, there's um, different graphs that would represent the same partition. So really what we're thinking about is actually equivalence classes of these graphs. Um, so here's another graph that corresponds to the same thing. Um, you could draw, draw as many edges as you want, as long as the connected components are um, matching perfectly with the, the blocks of the partition. All right, and then um, we put all of these things together. So for any um, number of upper and, and lower points, and we get the what we call the partition category. So I've told you what the elements of, of P are. Um, I haven't yet told you uh, how they compose or anything, but we can straight away talk about the domain and range maps that the domain of this partition is going to be six and the range is five. Just um, tells you how many points you've got top and bottom. All right, so how do we compose? Um, well, it's, it's similar to composing functions. Um, we get two um, partitions. They're only going to be composable if uh, the, the range of alpha equals the domain of beta. So we've got equal number of points in the middle here. And um, to compose them, we first of all stick them together. We end up with a picture like this with three rows of dots now. Now we simplify this by rubbing out the dots in the middle. And if there's anything that just happens to be floating like this block, we just throw it away. And we get something that looks like a partition uh, or looks like one of these graphs that might have edges that kind of um, go halfway from top to bottom and we just smooth everything out and, and we end up with a partition, which is the, the product. And then five to four, altogether the five disappears and we end up with something from three to four like this. All right, and that turns out to be um, an associative operation. We have a, have a nice category. Um, and well, endomorphism monoids, when we look at um, partitions where we've got the, um, an equal number of upper and lower points, these are um, uh, called partition monoids. Uh, and um, the identity partition looks like this. Um, and in fact, you can have any permutation diagram uh, you want. So we can just have lines joining top to bottom in, um, in any ordering and um, you essentially end up with copies of the symmetric groups um, inside the, um, the partitions, some of the other transformation semigroups as well. Right, now um, I could have told you a, uh, a little bit about um, uh, 
versions of um, the petition category in which um, we have, um, instead of just the bare bones um, diagrams, we have linear combinations of these. They compose in a way that actually counts these floating components. So uh, we would say alpha times beta is this diagram, alpha beta, but we multiply by some power of a, a fixed constant. And this M counts the number of, um, uh, of these floating components. But um, I'm not gonna say any more about that in today's talk. Um, essentially every result I um, present today will have a, um, a corresponding version for these things. Um, and you can read the, um, the preprint if you're, um, if you're interested in that. Right, um, so I've told you what the petition category is. There's two important subcategories um, that I'll mention as well. One is the brow category. These are all the petitions whose blocks have size two. So essentially, when we regard these things as graphs, they're, they're basically matchings. Um, if you compose things like this, you always get something back. Um, and as well as uh, the brow category, we have the temporary leap category. So these are all the, uh, the brow diagrams, which if you draw them within a rectangle like this, you can, uh, you can draw without any crossings. So this is a, an example of a planar uh, diagram. This one is not planar, even though we could try and draw this by making this edge here come around like that, that's not allowed because that goes out of the rectangle. So um, these are subcategories. Um, endomorphisms in these are um, brow monoids and, and temporary leave monoids. These have been studied a lot. Um, in the twisted case, we get the brow algebras and um, temporary leave algebras. Um, and one little um, observation we can uh, make at this point is that uh, because all of the uh, blocks have size two, um, there has to be altogether an even number of, of vertices in a, in a picture like this. That's um, the same thing as saying the number of upper vertices and the low, number of lower vertices have to have the same parity or that um, M and N have to be um, congruent modulo, modulo two. That's a point that'll come up a little bit in what, um, what follows. Um, so what are these things for? Well, they come up in um, theoretical physics in, in, um, in the first instance. Um, and last year I, um, I had a chance to chat with Paul Martin, who was one, one of the co-discoverers of, um, of these things. Um, him and, and um, Vaughan Jones. And um, I asked Paul, you know, where, where do they come from? What, what, what is it all about? And um, shortly after that, I realized that he'd been essentially talking about magnets for some um, amount of time. And um, that's, it sort of blew me away that that's where it comes from. But um, after, um, after they were introduced, they, um, they just seemed to turn up everywhere. So particularly temporally Lieb algebras and um, categories turn up in knot theory. Um, Brouwer um, algebras were introduced um, by Brouwer, and surprisingly, um, a long time before that, in um, papers about representation theory, and they come up absolutely everywhere. Um, they come up in semigroup theory, uh, which is good for me. And um, what else are they for? Um, personally, um, I just find these fun objects to work with, so that's basically why I want to work with them. Um, so let me show you an example of a presentation for one of these categories. This is the the Templi Lieb category. Um, so, uh, planar brow diagram supposedly has a presentation with two generators, one called U, one called upside down U. What are these generators? Well, U essentially is a diagram that looks like a U. It's a uh, two upper points, zero lower points, and then upside down U is one that looks like an upside down one of that. Um, there's some I's in this, which are not listed as, um, uh, not listed as a generator, but I uh, represents the identity element uh, from one point to one point. Uh, and just like in a, in a monoid presentation, we assume we've got um, identity elements in a, in a group presentation, we assume we've got inverses. Um, in a category presentation, we assume we've got identity elements. So this is just a freely existing um, bit of data in the, uh, in the, in the presentation. Um, but you should uh, have, have started to ask yourself, what's this, um, uh, hot cross bun symbol that has been snuck in. No one has said anything about that. Um, so I better uh, pause just to tell you what this um, symbol is and where that comes from. Um, the idea is that we've got this um, additional operation in, um, in these categories. So um, I'm calling it um, O plus. It's often called O times um, in the literature, but I prefer plus uh, for reasons we'll um, understand shortly. Um, but what do we do? Well, to compose absolutely any petitions, they don't have to match up in, in dimensions at all. To compose 
uh, them with this, um, or to, to add them, we just take beta, we stick it over on the right-hand side of alpha, and then if we need to, we, we um, shove points over until we just have a nice list, uh, list of, of points like this. So this is a, a copy of beta right next to alpha. So essentially just adding them and, and sticking them next to each other. And um, this is uh, called the tensor operation, tensor sum or tensor product, whichever way you like. And um, they're examples of what, uh, what are called tensor categories and um, strict tensor categories, meaning that they satisfy some laws. Um, so I won't go through all of these in detail, but um, for example, this first one just says, um, how many upper points do we have? Well, it's just however many upper points alpha had plus however many upper points beta had. Um, same thing with the number of lower points. So this is why I like the plus um, rather than multiplication. Um, associativity seems uh, pretty obvious. We're just sticking three things next to each other. It wouldn't matter in which order you did that. Um, the next law, adding the identity on zero. Well, the identity on zero is just uh, the empty partition. So you're just not adding anything. Um, so that has the effect of, of doing nothing. Um, adding identity elements works um, as you would expect. Um, and then we have this more complicated um, tensor axiom. And that's essentially telling you what happens when you take four things and you uh, want to compose them like this, would want to join them together like this. So um, the left-hand side of this law says what happens if First of all, we compose vertically and then add the, the results of that. The second or the right-hand side of that law says what happens if, first of all, we add that, then we um, compose what we've got together. And it says you get the same thing um, either way. And that's called a, a coherence law. Um, the word strict here uh, refers to the fact that all of these axioms have equal signs. Um, more generally, you can have um, uh, isomorphisms between these things, so you don't have to have, um, have strict equalities, but here, here we do. Um, and in fact, the transformation categories I mentioned before are examples of um, tensor categories as well, because if, you, if you've got two functions, you can, you can draw them as, um, uh, as graphs like this and then just stick them together to get, get bigger functions. Right, so here's, the, um, here's the, the presentation I had up before. Now we know what this... Um, operation is supposed to mean. Uh, let's have a think about what the relations say. The first one says if I do an upside down U composed with an ordinary U, we get the identity map on, or the identity uh, partition on zero points. Well, if we compose these two things, uh, what do we do? We forget about the middle row. That just means throwing the whole thing out. And we've just got this picture with no vertices up top, no vertices down the bottom, which is just the identity on zero. Um, the next law, uh, tells us what happens if we compose the two u's in the other direction. Um, here we don't get the empty map, um, rather we get this partition which I've drawn over on the, the right hand side that's got a u at the top and a u at the bottom. Um, in particular we could have got that by taking the two u's and um, sticking them together bringing either in from the right, so um, u and u commute with, um, with the, the tensor operation and they give us the same thing here. Um, the next law is, is quite nice. I plus upside down u is uh, shown in this picture. We've got an I here, we've got an upside down u, and the tensor then is we just bring them in. Um, and then if we do the same thing with the uh, ordinary u and an I, we get this. And in fact, this law basically tells us that if you have a twist in your, um, your picture, you can straighten it out and get the um, identity map, or the identity partition on one point. Same if the things are, are drawn in the other direction. So that's a, that's a list of three relations that, um, that happen to hold. And, um, and the theorem essentially is that these generate all relations. Um, so this second relation is, um, is to me quite nice, um, telling us that we've got this um, uh, nice relationship between the two generators. Um, they commute under one of the operations and, and somehow the composition is, is the same in one particular order. Um, but Deep into the um, to the work on this project, um, I noticed that in fact you can derive this directly from the the tensor category axiom. So um, there's a derivation here which I won't go into, um, but essentially this relation is just you get this for free. Um, it's just like in a in a group presentation, you never have to put in the associative law um, or anything like that. So there's a, a better version of this um, of this theorem, um, and 
Um, one one um, aspect of the theorem that I haven't mentioned yet is that, well, these two uh, two things are supposedly generators. So um, I haven't tried to convince you that any temporary lead diagram is a, is somehow built out of these generators, but um, as an example, uh, the the temporary lead diagram I had before can be written as um, some combination of, of these generators like this. Right. Um, what about the brow category? Um, remember, this is the, the category of all brow diagrams, which are, are matchings. Um, here, we're allowed to have crossings because we're no longer forcing, enforcing planarity. So we end up with um, a simple brow diagram with a, with a single crossing, call this X. Um, to continue the, the pattern of making the generators look like um, the things that they are. And we get a, a longer list of relations, but each of these can be um, checked and they all um, say fairly sensible things. So XX, um, X composed with X is the same as I plus another I next to it. That's um, one of the symmetric group re re uh, relations, just saying a transposition undoes itself. Then we've got this relation, which we already saw for the temporary lead category. Um, this relation, which is a little bit like a um, rider master move that tells us we can un undo a kink like so. And we've got an upside down version of the same thing. Uh, the second relation looks the most complicated of all, but in fact, that's basically a braid relation. X plus I is this nice little um, petition. And in fact, it's a, it's a permutation. I plus X is this one. And this just um, is, as I said, a braid relation. Um, then we get this nice relation from the um, from the brow category, which we've already seen. Sorry, from the template lead category, telling us how to undo a um, undo a loop. And then we've got two versions of essentially the same relation that tells us what happens when um, a upper um, arc uh, is crossed by a, um, a a vertical arc. So it essentially tells us two ways to represent this picture in the middle as a combination of um, of the generators. And then, like I said, the, the last relation is just a, well, it's a mirror image of, of that one. Um, if you suppress the tensor product symbol, or the tensor sum symbol, in fact, the, um, the, the terms here look even more like the, um, the, the petitions that they're representing. So XI is this thing that just really looks like XI. Looks like some kind of weird um, Roman numerals expression. Okay, the petition category is a, is a bigger category. That's um, uh, where we've just got absolutely anything can be stuck together. Um, and that looks like this. Oh, yeah. Can I ask a question? All right. So um, when I uh, was okay. um, starting this work, this was basically my goal to, to come up with a, um, a, a category presentation for, for P, um, which, which is here. Um, it was only after basically finishing the paper that I discovered that someone else had also done, uh, found a, a presentation for, for P. It was in terms of different generators. So they, um, they used these things, um, which I'm calling V and upside down V. I think um, it was called maybe ETER and something else um, in the paper. Um, but that, um, that paper, which is um, uh, coming soon to algebras and representation theory, you can find it's about a, um, a bigger class of um, categories called jellyfish petition categories, which are basically petition diagrams like before, but um, you throw some jellyfish in. Um, and the proof of that result is very short and it essentially relies on some, um, um, it, it, it um, draws on some results from um, Abrams and Koch on some um, pretty heavy, heavy machinery. Um, what about the, Brow category proof. So this was um, Lira and Zhang um, in their uh, paper in the um, EMS journal. Um, they um, they actually gave a very detailed proof of this um, of this, not assuming um, crazy results, and that was maybe um, eight or ten pages um, of of direct calculations. Um, as for the temporary leap category, there's a lot of um, arguments that have been given for it in the in the literature. Um, there's uh, some of them are, are very conceptual. Um, and in fact, many presentations for any kinds of diagram things are, are, are basically pretty um, conceptual often. So my, um, my real goal for this work was to um, come up with a way to um, get at presentations for these things. 
Um, and the main goal was to make it, you know, absolutely watertight and and, and be sure that everything um, really works. Um, and the the method that I had in mind was to somehow use the fact that we know a lot about um, presentations for the for the monoids, um, the, the endomorphism monoids, which are um, petition monoids and, and those sorts of things. So um, eventually, I, I came up with a method that worked, um, and came up with um, essentially the presentations that were um, shown before. Um, and essentially, after making the same method work for a few different examples, you eventually work out what what it is that actually makes it work. So um, came up with a list of properties that a category would need to to have uh, so that the method would work. Um, list of um, axioms, and ended up with um, some general results that tell you how to find presentations. And then for each uh, each of the examples and, and more, you just basically um, turn, a, turn some kind of handle. Um, so all of the diagram categories I mentioned, it works for all of those transformation categories I mentioned, some other ones which I'll um, talk about if we have time, and even some um, uh, other examples based on um, braids and, and other things. So, um, What's the uh, what's the pattern? Well, you've got a, a category like um, like the kind we've been looking at, something that has objects uh, object set natural numbers, so some kind of partial monoid. Um, it has to have some kind of um, basic, very um, basic properties uh, that are all structural, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, we have to have uh, we have to find presentations for the endomorphism monoids, um, and by find I mean either find them yourself or else maybe find a paper that um, that has them in there. And we then have two results. So one, one tells us how to um, somehow combine all of these ingredients and obtain a category presentation. This will be big in a, in a sense that we'll see shortly. Um, and then a second, a second theorem that tells us how to convert that into a tensor category presentation, which we hope will somehow be small. Um, so, the idea is that this is what we really want. Um, we want a nice tensor presentation of the kind that, uh, that we've seen before, two or three generators, um, and a nice finite list of relations, elegant and, and compact. Um, and the idea is how could you possibly get to something like that? Um, sometimes the thing that you want is hard to get, but something that's not as ideal is um, a bit easier. So you start with that. Uh, but then once you have some presentation, you can essentially try and get any presentation by uh, performing some local moves on that, um, teacher transformations or um, or something something like that, and um, and we get what we uh, wanted in the first place just by a slightly um, uh, circuitous route. Um, and so this is uh, an example of um, what I've come to call the the Vicky trick, um, named after Vicky Gould. Here, um, I was visiting York. Uh, a few years ago, and um, Vicky had a visitor called Ricky, who was um, in the middle of the picture, and um, they um, they renamed me Mickey um, to to fit uh, the triad. And essentially, this was um, the trick that we came up with in a in a paper. We had a presentation we were really hoping to to find for um, something completely different, um, and it was really tricky. But we came up with um, something quite ugly, and then transformed that into the thing we wanted. All right, so what are these theorems? Um, I'll try and uh, tell you what they are. So there's, um, there's a list of assumptions. Um, so the first one is, well, obviously we're uh, talking about categories over N, and then we have a, um, a, a condition that tells us essentially when morphism sets are non-empty. So this is like a connectivity assumption. Um, so it tells us that there's a fixed integer D, and morphism sets are, are non-empty precisely when um, the, the integers are congruent mod D. Okay, now if D is one, then anything is congruent to anything, so that just tells us everything is non-empty. So for the petition category, um, it's not hard to see that given any number of upper and lower dots, M and N, you can find um, petitions. You can just add edges however you want. In fact, you don't even have to add edges, and you can have this petition that just petitions the set into singletons. Okay, even if you had um, no lower uh, vertices, you still have a uh, morphism because this is still a perfectly good uh, partition of that set. You might even have some edges in the in the top as well. Okay, what about the Brouwer category? Well, I already mentioned that um, to have a 
um, a brow diagram, you have to have um, either top and bottom, um, both even or both odd. That's just saying M and N have to be congruent one to two. So fine. Um, again, if you've got um, one of those zero, everything is fine as long as the other um, number is um, even. Okay, as for the transformation category, okay, all mappings from endpoints to endpoints, it might feel again as if we can always um, draw a function, just draw lines anywhere. Um, but we have a slight problem, which is that when there's no points down below, um, there's nowhere for these things to map. So we can't pretend we've got an empty function because um, T is a set of all totally defined functions. So T is a little bit more complicated than the other categories. It almost works for this. We can take D equals one and we only have this problem when, um, uh, when N is zero and N is non-zero. So there's a little bit more complication for this category. Um, the second assumption is that um, we've got some one-sided units. So uh, I'll explain this with pictures. Basically in the petition case, um, D equals one. So we've got, uh, we've got a lambda map that maps from N up to N plus one and one that goes in the reverse direction. And if you compose these, lambda with rho, all you end up with is just an identity uh, uh, mapping on endpoints. So we've got this, um, got this law here. In general, if you compose them in the other direction, you're not necessarily going to get a, um, an identity. Um, so we've got uh, essentially one-sided units here. Um, what does it look like for Brouwer? Well, we can't just have a single dot, but we can have um, uh, a kind of hook down, the, down below, and d equals 2 in this case, so we're going from n to n plus two. Um, these diagrams work for the templi lieb of course, because um, those pictures are planar. Um, as for partial transformations, we can use the same pictures I had before for the petitions. Um, they are injective, so they work for um, uh, the category of um, partial bijections as well. Um, but when we come to look at um, totally defined maps, this row doesn't work because it's not, um, not totally defined. We can easily fix that just by making that point map anywhere we feel like. Composing these functions will leave you the identity map. Um, but again, we see a, a slight um, subtle uh, problem here, which is that this, uh, this guy is only well-defined if n is at least one. So there's some, some slight gap at the um, n equals zero case here as well. Um, assumption three essentially just says that um, each endomorphism monoid has a known presentation. I mean, you don't even have to know what this is, but um, just has to, there just has to be one. Um, so for example, each of the categories I've mentioned before um, have, uh, have endomorphism monoids with known presentations um, listed there. Um, then it's a, a reasonably um, quick lemma to prove that with these generating sets for the endomorphism monoids and just these one-sided units, they somehow form a generating set for your entire category. So this, um, this is maybe slightly surprising. You don't have to have much going on between um, morphism or between different objects, just a, a single uh, one of these uh, pair of these one-sided units and we get everything. Um, assumption four is basically just something telling us how to construct a set of relations. Um, so uh, we have to have a set of relations that happens to hold, obviously. Um, and all we have to do is make sure we throw in all of the relations from the endomorphism monoids. We throw in relations saying that these lambda and rho are, are indeed one-sided units. Um, I mentioned that rho lambda doesn't have to be an identity element, but it will be something. So we have to have a relation that says that it's something or other, writing, writing it as, as a word in the um, generators of the, the bigger endomorphism monoid. Um, and then a technical condition that I'm not going to go into that essentially tells us that whatever relations you put in here, they better be strong enough to, to prove a certain um, technical fact. And the theorem says that um, if all of these assumptions hold, then you have a, um, have a presentation. So the, um, uh, the point is that these one-sided units, well, they exist in all of the, um, all of the categories uh, I mentioned before. Uh, all of the um, endomorphism monoids have known presentations, so we uh, certainly have those. Uh, and then, well, even if this, um, this last um, set of relations or this last condition seems tricky, you could even just throw in these relations and, and, um, and you'll have assumption for holding as well. So it's, um, it's a very applicable uh, theorem. 
Um, these are a list of categories where it holds. Um, most of the assumptions are easy enough to check. You just have to show that certain things exist. Um, the exceptions are the presentations uh, for the endomorphism monoids. Um, each of those uh, really is a, a substantial paper. Um, this, uh, this technical condition actually involves um, checking that your relations are, are strong enough to, to do something. Um, but then you've, um, then you've got it. So a couple of applications. Um, first of all, the petition category. You end up with something that looks like this. You have some simple-ish um, generators and a very big list of relations. So this is what I mean when I say that the thing is big. So we've got infinitely many generators, infinitely many relations, and generally, um, generally quite a few of them. Um, this is the, the Brow category. We have simple, a smaller list of um, uh, generators, but still got, um, still got a sort of complicated collection of uh, relations. Even for the template lead category, we get something like this. So remember I said these, this sort of um, thing is a means to an end. We want to go from here to, a, uh, to tensor presentations. So, um, well, we really want tensor presentations. So um, let me tell you about um, how, we, how we do that. Um, theorem B has two uh, extra assumptions. The first one is that we've just got a strict tensor category. Um, the, uh, the, the sixth one is that um, we've got a nice set of relations um, each of them obviously holds. And then something uh, much more technical uh, involving uh, a connection between this new set of uh, uh, things that are supposed to be generators, generators using composition and the tensor uh, operation. Um, and I won't go through this, but it's, um, it's all in the paper and it's um, just a bit more technical. Um, I'll say a couple of words on the next page. Uh, but the idea is that given all of these assumptions, then uh, you, you kind of magically have this tensor presentation. So um, the main work in, uh, in applying this theorem to particular examples is to um, uh, work with these words um, that uh, I've brushed under the, um, uh, swept under the rug here, um, the hat words. All they are is, uh, is, uh, is as follows. So we've got a generator of our category, like maybe this guy. Um, so that's a that's an x, and we want to define an x hat. Um, that's going to be some term uh, involving uh, the supposed tensor generators that represents this. So what's an example? Um, well, this just looks like i i i i x i i. Um, the first four i's is just an identity map on four points. Then we've got an x, which is our generator that, of course, we called x. Then we've got a um, identity on two points. So this is a term in the generators, in the tensor generators, representing our ordinary generator. So that's the hat of, of this thing. And um, all the other things look basically the same. So a tor thing looks like that. We've just got a U and a upside down U with some identities as well. Um, the lambdas and rows uh, similarly are expressed like that. And you've got to show a bunch of, um, a bunch of things happen with, uh, with terms like this. So it's a computational kind of thing. Right, so um, I've mentioned a few times that the, the category T doesn't satisfy this, um, the nice connectivity uh, result, but um, you can basically prove a, a slightly more um, involved version of that to, uh, to, to prove a theorem that essentially has the same kind of um, conclusion, but um, works for more complicated category, categories like that. Um, so how can we apply this? Uh, well, I'm just going to list a, a few things that, that come out of applying it. We've got the template lead category presentation I mentioned before, um, this Brower thing, uh, and the petition category. So by this point in the paper, it's, it's about 20 pages in. We've uh, proved all the general results and also um, obtained essentially all the, um, the known presentations for diagram categories um, in the literature. Um, then there's some uh, some tensor presentations for these transformation categories. So this is all mappings uh, from points. We've got a transposition. We've got a, uh, a simple uh, transformation that's not injective. So two points mapping to one, call that V. Uh, then we've got a, a very simple transformation that's not surjective. So it maps zero points to one point. Uh, and then I is the, the identity 
uh, on one point, which, as I said before, is a freely existing um, piece of data in the in any um, in any category presentation. Um, and I won't go through all the uh, all the relations there, but you can um, you know fiddle with any any you like. XV just means if I do X and then stick a V under here, well, the X just just disappears. Um, but, so the point is not that the relations hold, but the point is that somehow any relation um, that happens to hold among these generators can be deduced from these very simple ones. Um, for partial transformations, we also have to include a, um, a mapping here, an, an empty mapping, so zero, sorry, one point at the top that doesn't map anywhere. This is not a full transformation, but it is a partial transformation. Again, we get a nice um, succinct collection of um, laws there. Uh, the category of um, partial bijections, here we don't have the non-injective um, V generator, uh, and we end up with this list of um, list of relations here. <clears throat> so other um, other examples which I haven't talked about yet, but um, you've seen the uh, the symbols. We've got category called O, which is the set of all um, order preserving transformations or isotone transformations. This is kind of like the planar version of um, of T where um, now we don't have the X generated because that's, um, that's not an order preserving mapping. Um, so we just have V and upside down U, very simple list of relations. Um, partial order preserving transformations, you know, just different combinations of the, of the generators and um, different, um, uh, different relations. Order preserving partial bijections, all you need is just a single relation. Um, so we've got a mapping that sends something nowhere and a mapping that sends nothing, well, also nowhere, um, and just a single relation there. Um, other examples of categories that we can um, deal with are um, all kinds of things. So any combination of injective, surjective, partial, full, whatever, you name it. Um, so just a couple of pictures to, uh, to finish. Um, there are some nice categories of um, objects called um, called vines. So I mentioned braids at the start of the talk. Vines are like braids, except uh, strings can come down and then join up. Okay, once they join up, they have to have to keep going. They can't come apart again. But so these are some examples of vines. These compose in a kind of mixture of um, braids and um, and diagrams. You stick them together like so, and then any string that doesn't manage to go from top to bottom is just thrown away. So we get a, a thing like this. Um, we can also um, tensor these, so you can just stick two of them together. So uh, we have a, um, a, a category of um, partial vines. Um, within there, we've got the, the category of full vines. So these are things where you're never missing any string, so every point on the top has a string coming down. Um, and then we've got the, the partial braid category, which is this guy here. Okay, um, vines where strings never come together. So they're just like braids that um, are missing a few strings. So these are all um, these are all tensor categories, and um, you know again I won't won't go through all the um, details, but um, you can you can come up with nice presentations by applying the uh, the general machinery, partial vines, full vines, um, partial braids. Um, you can actually um, uh, you can actually say these are these are braided categories. It's probably not a surprise if you know what um, braided categories are. Um, you can say okay, what about if we just take, well, regard this as a as a braided category presentation, where we, as well as assuming identities and things, we assume that there are braids. Um, in that case, X and X inverse are just things that are free. Okay, we don't even need this because that's just something we assume. Uh, this second law is just a braid relation that's for free, um, and remarkably, all of these other um, uh, relations follow from axioms of um, of braided categories, and in fact. All you end up with needing is this um, UU equals the identity relation. So that's quite a um, quite a surprise. Um, and in fact, this is exactly the same presentation as the order preserving um, injective maps, except now we're regarding this as a as a braided category presentation. So um, you probably get the idea. There's lots and lots of categories, and um, this is basically what I end up looking like if I um, say too much more about uh, these sort of things. So instead, it's um, time to stop and thank you very much for your attention. The, um, the archive paper or the archive link is there. 
And uh, yes, so thanks very much. And I'll be happy to answer questions if anyone has one. Thank you, James. So I'm going to unmute everyone or unmute yourself at your, at your will, ask questions. I do believe Mari had a question, but you were really in the zone. So we had to wait. For Actually, I realized at the last second that I'd muted my computer just to make sure you guys wouldn't hear any sounds. But that was ridiculous because I've got headphones on and it wouldn't have happened anyway. So I've probably plowed on through all kinds of... Yeah, um, so is there some reason that they always end up being finite, these presentations? Um, only, yeah, that, so that's a really good question. Um, there are some other examples that, uh, that I don't know presentations for, or that I didn't, didn't talk about today. Es essentially, the reason is that for the kinds of examples that I've looked at, the big presentations always have generators that look some, something like these. Okay. Um, and all these are is a bunch of identity elements plus some pretty simple things. So you can, you can basically make these pictures out of just small building blocks. So you can have an I, an X, um, this thing I call the D, uh, then you've got the up and the, and the down things. Um, there are other examples, like really natural examples, like um, just for example, all binary relations or something where endomorphism monoids don't have these uniform generators. So um, yeah, there's no intrinsic reason why you, why when you write down, you know, a million examples of um, tensor presentations, well, you just have to have three generators and six relations or, or whatever. Um, it's just, it's just that these categories are nice enough. So for the, the binary relation example, I'm not, not even sure if it's finitely generated um, as a tensor category or not. Even, even that seems like a good, good thing to think about. Okay. Any other questions for James? I had a question about something that you mentioned briefly, which was this jellyfish partition thing. Could ah. you briefly explain what that is? Um, the short answer is no. Um, essentially, <laughs> so if you look up the paper, which I recommend, you, you'll see these fantastic diagrams, which are basically petitions. And inside, you have literally jellyfish um, floating around. So it's somehow, as far as I can tell, some kind of, um, it, it introduces some kind of asymmetry. So it's, it's a jellyfish, which is basically a blob that has things coming out of it below. Um, so I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent sure what these things really are. Um, but if you, um, if you look it up, you'll, you'll, you'll find out. So yeah, sorry, sorry to not be able to fill you in on that. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions for James? Well, if not, then let's thank James for his talk it was really nice and i must say for myself i was surprised that it was a very understandable for talk about categories at least for me <laughs> excellent <laughs> okay well thanks everyone